Folks, it's good to see you tonight. Hope you are doing well. You come to hear something about the devil tonight. Just before services, I was talking with Sister Lisa Bohuslav, and she said that uh, she had some of the kids in her class draw a picture of what the devil might look like. Of course, no one's ever seen the devil. None of us have, at least. I remember a story about a uh, teacher in a pre-K class. She asked her kids in the class that I want each of you to draw a Bible character for me. And as she looked at what this one little girl was drawing, she asked the little girl, what are you drawing, sweetie? God. The teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. The little girl said, they will when I get done. <laughs> I don't know what God looks like. I don't know what the devil looks like. The Bible does not give us a physical description of such. But I do know this, that a lot of people are interested in the origin of Satan. And when we ask the question, where did the devil come from? The most common answer is this, that Satan was once an angel, the most beautiful of all the angels, but he rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven and became the devil. And when asked, where would you find that, the argument is made that is found in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 14, and beginning at verse number 12. And this is an airtight argument. And the How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pits. This is the prime passage that is offered for the origin of Satan. Someone says, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, after all, it uses the word Lucifer, doesn't it? And everybody knows that Lucifer is the name of the devil. Well, that sounds pretty good. But I think this argument ought to be examined, and we ought to take another look at it. Satan. Now, someone says, okay, I don't understand your picture. You got a picture of the moon, and it looks like it's getting to be either dawn or dusk, one or the other. What's that about? Well, just hang with me. You thought I would put up someone with a pitchfork and horns and red and all this sort. No. Now, there's a purpose for using this picture, so just stay with me, and you'll learn something else. Question about the origin of the devil. I, I can tell you already that some of you. You just might be disappointed by the time I'm done, by the time we're done, as we search the Scriptures. Because there's a possibility, at least, that we may not learn the origin of the devil from the Scriptures. And if we don't have it from the Scriptures, we're probably not going to learn it at all. It just might be that the origin of the devil falls into the classification of Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, where it says the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed belong to us, to our children, that we may keep all the words of this law. And so if I never learn the origin of the devil, well, I can tolerate that, I think. That just might be something that belongs to the mind of God and not to you or to me. But I do know this, that what is revealed, I've got to study that and I've got to believe that. And let me tell you some things that are revealed about the devil himself. I'm going to begin our lesson tonight by giving you four things that we know about Satan. Now, there are obviously more than four. I think I could easily populate a list of 15 things that we know about Satan. But I want to give you four because they are germane to our lesson about the origin of Satan. 
The first thing I'm going to say about what we know about Satan is that he is real. He is not a mythical creature. And the reason I say that, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 4, and in verse number 1, Matthew 4, 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus treated the devil as an entity. Not something that was mythical, okay? And so since I believe in Jesus, you know, believing in Jesus settles a whole lot of questions. Have you ever thought about that? Someone says, I want to know, did that whale really swallow Jonah? And did Noah really have all those animals on the ark? And were Adam and Eve real people? Well, in those cases, Jesus addressed those things, and his answer was yes, yes, and yes. And so when you believe in Jesus, you've got a lot of questions answered. Real, because I, I believe the devil rather, because Jesus treated him as real, not a mythical creature. The second thing I would say is that he is a created being. Now, I would argue that from Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1, 16, here it speaks of Jesus, and Jesus is the creator of all that is. In Colossians 1, 16, it says, By him, that is, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Verse 17 says, He is before all things, and by him all things consist. So whatever may exist in the entirety of the universe and the entirety of all the creation, Jesus is the creator of it. And since Satan exists, then Jesus must be the creator of Satan. Now someone says, why does Jesus create an evil being? Well, that's, you're drawing a conclusion that is unwarranted. And to believe that Jesus created this being as evil. Everything that God created, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, everything God created, he looked at it and said, what? It was good. Everything God made was good. And he made man and he made woman, and they were good. But they became evil, didn't they? And so it just may be that Satan was created, whatever kind of being he was, was created good and became evil. Someone says, well, I still believe that Satan is a fallen angel who rebelled against God and he became the devil because God cast him out of heaven. Well, that's a theory that a lot of people hold to. And let me it's probably as good a theory as any. But what we're doing tonight is not just saying, oh, here's a theory or that theory or this proposition or that. I knew something was amiss, folks. Is my tie straight now? What we're doing tonight is we're trying to search the scriptures for the origin of Satan, okay? Not just to say, well, here's a good theory. Theories may have their place in some areas, but when we're looking for an actual answer, theories may not give us the answer. That sounds better, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So we've, we've settled this, that he is a created being. Now, I remember in a, in a lesson that uh, I, I taught years ago in a Bible class, there was someone who answered a question about the devil, and they said, well, the devil is like God. He's always been. He had no beginning. Be careful when you say stuff like that. Because if the devil is eternal, how do you know then that in the eternal conflict of things, the devil's, maybe he's going to win and God is going to lose. If he's eternal, that's a quality of deity. And so that's a problem if you state it that way. Ladies and gentlemen, he is not like God. He has not always been. He is a created being since Jesus has created all things that exist besides God. He's created all things, then Satan must be a created being. And, and as a created being, and since he is not like God, he's not like God in knowledge. He doesn't know everything. Remember in the story about Job? God knew that Job would, would, would be faithful to him, that Job would not turn against him. The devil didn't know that. 
And so the devil is limited in his knowledge. The devil is also limited in his power. I, I'm reminded of Luke chapter 22, I think it's verse 26, where Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Satan had to get permission in order to tempt Peter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, there the scripture says, There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God will, with the temptation, make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. A lot of you have that verse memorized. Satan puts a temptation before us, and God does what? God makes a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. So there's a limitation on Satan's power. Can you see that? Another passage to look at is in Matthew chapter 12, and verse 26. Matthew chapter 12. And here Jesus, after casting out a demon, says this. And once again, he demonstrates that he has power that is greater than Satan. And he says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 26. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you, or else... How can one enter a strong man's house, plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, then he will plunder his house? Jesus says, I have bound the strong man. Satan here is the strong man. Jesus has entered his domain and has bound him, plundered his house. What does that tell you? Satan's power is limited. So do not get the idea that Satan has some kind of unlimited power and that he can do anything and everything that he might want to do. He has to have permission in order to act. But here's a fourth thing about Satan. You need to know this, that he abuses Scripture. And I'm turning now to Matthew chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7. In verse 6, this is the temptation of Jesus Satan said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He's quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. Satan is quoting Scripture. Someone says, Well, <laughs> you know, my preacher, he quotes Scripture, so he has to be right. The devil quotes Scripture, but he has to be wrong. Because he is misusing and misapplying the scripture. Jesus answers him and says, it is written again. That is, it is also written. You've not given the whole story. You've only given part of the picture, but there's another verse that has bearing on this subject. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. That's Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 7. But here's what I want you to see that's germane to our point tonight. Satan abuses scripture. Now, as we do our search for the origin of Satan from the Bible, is it okay for us to just use any passage in any way that we want and pay no attention to context? You think that's a good idea? I think that's about as bad an idea as you'll ever find. Folks, when you go to the Bible, you've got to respect the fact that this is the Word of God and you cannot make of it just anything that you want it to be. So here we go. And we're not going to abuse Scripture. I'm going to lock every verse. There's four verses that are used to speak of the origin of Satan that people say is the devil's origin. And we're going to stay in the context on every one of them, okay? Here we go. Here are passages that are misapplied to Satan's origin. First of all, we're going to Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Luke 10, verse 18. And someone looks at this and say, wow, this nails it. Satan is a fallen angel. He fell from heaven. According to Luke, this is Jesus himself speaking. So we know now the origin of Satan. Be careful. Luke 10, verse 18. Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. See, it said Satan fell from heaven. No, it didn't. Someone says, yes, it did. I say, no, it didn't. You didn't read the verse carefully. This verse is what is called a simile. And when you've got the term like or as, it's simile. It's comparing, it's comparing one thing to another thing. And he says, I saw Satan fall. How'd you see him fall? I saw him fall like lightning from heaven, says Jesus. Just like lightning comes down from the cloud and strikes the earth. It is sudden, it's abrupt. 
And what Jesus is saying here is that's how I saw Satan fall. He doesn't say he saw Satan fall from heaven. You look at it carefully, it doesn't say that. But commentator after commentator say that. Oh yeah, here it is. What's the context? Context is our best friend, ladies and gentlemen. It's our best friend. The context is the 70 that Jesus has set, sent out. They're returning for it with joy. And they say to Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And so these 70 have been casting out demons. And what's the impact of this? Look at verse number 19. Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Who is the enemy? The enemy is Satan. I give you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What Jesus is teaching here is that he has given to these 70 men power to cast out demons and the casting out of demons marks a fall of Satan's authority. Satan has lost power at this point. Because Jesus has come along and given to these men the authority to cast out demons, those that are ruled by Satan, Jesus now has given these men power over these things. This isn't talking about the fall. It's not talking about the fall of Satan from heaven. It is rather talking about a loss of Satan's authority, a loss of his power. It has nothing to do with Satan's origin. It rather has to do with how Jesus saw him fall in regard to his power. Okay? That's Luke 10, verse 18. Has nothing to do with the fall of Satan out of heaven who once was an angel and now became the devil. No. Here's a second one that is offered. And a brother in Jesus argued this to me. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, here you've got a passage that speaks of Satan being cast out from heaven. There's no question it says that. Revelation 12, verse 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And someone says, see, this passage clearly shows Satan's origin and fall from heaven. Again, if you isolate a passage from its context, you might be able to make it say what it does not say, but the text does not say that. Pay attention to our good friend. Who's our good friend? Context. And when you look carefully at the context, I've got to turn the page back to chapter 12, verse 1 of Revelation. I want you to know when this happened. Because if this is the origin of the devil, then it had to happen prior to, to Genesis chapter 3 because you've got Satan there appearing in the form of a serpent. So if this is Satan's origin, it had to happen prior to Genesis 3, right? Okay, now here's your problem. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. You've got to remember that the book of Revelation is highly dramatic, figurative, apocalyptic language that gives you these magnificent scenes of grandeur and, and detail and description in order that you might get a picture of what's happening. And so here this woman is portrayed. This woman is the people of God. And this woman, the people of God, gives birth to a child. Who do you think the child would be that comes from the people of God? Who do you think that might be? Somebody say it. Are you, are you afraid to say Jesus? Go ahead and say Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the one who's going to be born from this woman. Now look at it in verse number 5. Well, verse number 2, she, being with child, cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Okay, so she's going to give birth. Who is the child? Verse number 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Jesus. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, that's what's happened so far in chapter 12. Then, chapter 12, verses 7, 8, and 9 describe war in heaven. You see, what Satan has tried to do, and what he's tried to do from the beginning when Jesus was born, he tried to destroy Jesus when he was first born. Remember Matthew chapter 2, the story about the child that was born, and Herod tries to kill the baby Jesus. Remember that story? He's, that's Satan behind all that, who's trying to destroy him. In fact, it says that in, in Revelation chapter 12. If you look back at verse 4, 
It speaks of this one who drew a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And so Satan is trying to destroy Christ as soon as he is born. We see that in Matthew chapter 2. Well, he's unsuccessful. Everything Satan does along the way is unsuccessful to destroy Jesus. Now Jesus has ascended into heaven and the picture now that is portrayed is one of Satan trying to destroy Jesus in heaven. And so there is war in heaven, verse number 7 says. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is a highly dramatic scene. Not that these things actually happen in a literal sense. But it's simply saying that Christ was protected from Satan and Satan could not defeat Jesus. So if he can't defeat Jesus, what's he going to do? What's he going to do if he cannot defeat Jesus personally? Who's he going to go after? He's going to go after the woman, the woman, the, the people of God. And that's what you see in the remainder of the chapter. Look at the very last verse, 17, 12, 17. The dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Folks, this is not the origin of Satan. It cannot be. Why not? Because whatever is happening in Revelation 12, 9 happens after the ascension of Jesus into heaven. This can't be his origin. His origin had to be way, way before that. Someone says, well, the time factor really doesn't matter. Why not? Just because you say it doesn't matter doesn't mean it doesn't matter. This is not the origin of Satan. This is simply saying that Satan could not defeat Jesus, couldn't defeat him on earth. No way he can defeat him on heaven. So what does he do? He turns on you, the people of God. That's Revelation 12. Context, our very good friend. Ah, but we're not done. Here's another one. This time Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. Now you may not be familiar with this text. But those who advocate that Satan is a fallen angel, they're very familiar with it. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Ooh, be careful. Because it's telling us right off in the context who it's spoken to. Take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your many timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub. Someone says, ooh, that sounds like an angel to me. It's talking about Satan. He was the anointed angel, the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Someone says, see, there's the devil. He was created perfect, but sin was found in him and he was cast down to the earth. It even called him a cherub. That's an angel. So here you've got the origin of Satan. Well, thanks to our good friend context, we can't conclude that. Because first of all, it said it was the king of Tyre, didn't it? Tyre was a city on the Mediterranean Sea. It was a primary trading city, a merchant city. In fact, if you read the next verse, verse number 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. Satan is involved in merchant uh, trading. Is that it? Context. You can't just pull these verses out. I'm going all the way back to chapter 26. In chapter 26, in verse number 1, this is Ezekiel 26. It came to pass on the 11th year, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she who is broken was the gateway of the peoples. Now she is turned over to me. Tyre says, I'm taking over Jerusalem. I can do that. No one can stop me. I should be filled. She is laid waste. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. God is speaking against this nation of Tyre. Tyre actually had two parts. There was a city on the coast and then there was an island city. It was all part of the same complex. And it was a beautiful, beautiful place. In fact, Tyre liked to brag about how beautiful she was. I'm looking at verse uh, verse 1 of chapter 27 now. The word of the Lord came again to me saying, Now, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre and say to Tyre, You are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples on many coastlands. Thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Just look at me, says the city of Tyre. How wonderful we are in this place. And so what Ezekiel does... He speaks first against the city, the nation, the land. Then he's going to speak against the king of that land. And so I'm moving to chapter 28 now. In chapter 28, the word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, there's your ruler, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a god. Now he's not talking about the city. He's now talking about the ruler of the city of Tyre. You are a man and not a god. Listen, this city was so full of itself that we said, hey, we're just perfect here. We are great. We're awesome. We're greater than anyone. In fact, I, the ruler, I am a god. And that was not uncommon among ancient rulers. That's something that happened a lot. You find a lot of examples of that in history as well as in the Bible. But look down at verse number 6. In verse number 6 of chapter 28, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom. There's that beauty thing again. And defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. And you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Is Satan going to die out in the ocean? Is, is that what we're to understand here? This is not about the devil. It's already told us that it's about the king of Tyre and it calls him a man and says he's not a god. Continues in verse 9, Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a god? You, you just watch when the Medes and the Persians come against you and when the Babylonians come against you and when, when Alexander the Great comes against you. Let's see how long you can stand up and say, I am a god. No, you will not stand. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God, but you shall be a man and not a God. Over and over it keeps telling us that this is a man, but people say, oh, I think it's the devil. Well, you may think it's the devil, but the text tells us, context tells us that it's a man. Someone says, but well, what are you going to do with all this that says that you were the seal of perfection, wisdom, perfect in beauty? Listen, these words are spoken in irony. This is the disposition that the city of Tyre had. It's not saying that they actually were perfect or that there was never anything wrong with them. What it's saying is that this was the disposition of this city. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That's what you thought about yourself. But you're going to lose all that. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. They regarded the city of Tyre as like being in Eden, but it was all going to be brought down. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Talking about the beauty of the city itself. Verse number 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. So there, that's it. The devil was a cherub. Cherub's an angel. This is the devil. He fell. The anointed cherub who covers is talking about the covering, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the cherub that were there on the Ark of the Covenant? The beauty, the magnificence of that, of that Ark of the Covenant? This is how Tyre regarded itself. Really great, really beautiful, really wonderful. But God says, you're going to lose all this. You're going to come down and you're going to have nothing. And you're going to die the death of a man. You're going to die in the sea. And you're not going to have, you're not going to have anything because your city will be destroyed the same as you will be destroyed. 
God had established this man, the king of Tyre. God had established this nation and this city. But because they were so lifted up with pride, God says, no, you're going down. Look at, the, look at verses 17 and following. This is chapter 28, 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, and it was a beautiful place to be sure. But your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst and devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror. You shall be no more forever. The city of Tyre brought down to nothing. That's the context. And context is our friend. But someone says, what about that Isaiah passage? You can't get around the fact that Isaiah in chapter 14 and verse 12 can't get around the fact that it uses the term Lucifer. Indeed, it does use the term Lucifer but maybe we need to call our old friend context again. Maybe we need to ask context a few questions. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And indeed it is so in verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you're cut down to the ground, who weakened the nations. Someone says, well, this text is about Lucifer. Lucifer is the devil. This is the origin of the devil. Well, it isn't about Satan. It's about the king of Babylon. In fact, it says so. Look back in verse number 4 of Isaiah chapter 14. That you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city has ceased. It's interesting that Isaiah does the same thing as Ezekiel. He speaks first against the nation and then against the ruler of the nation. So I'm going to back up to chapter 13 and watch what it does. Chapter 13 and verse 1, the burden against Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos saw. And so he's speaking now against Babylon, the nation. Now, as you go to chapter 14, verse 1, the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, that is, on the people of Israel, and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them. They will cling to the house of Jacob. Then people will take them and bring them to their place, and the servants, the house of Israel, will possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. The people of Babylon are going to become servants to the people of Israel. They will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. It shall come to pass in the day that the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve. This is talking about the Babylonian captivity and that it will come to an end. God's going to give them rest. When this day comes and the captivity ends, verse 4, that you will take up this proverb or a taunt, as some translations say, you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. It is speaking against the king of Babylon and his high position that he held. Notice some of the things that it says about him against the king of Babylon. Verse 4 continues, how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. King of Babylon ruled over the golden city. I would remind you that Satan rules over the kingdom of darkness. This was the golden city that this man ruled over, the scepter of the rulers. Verse number six, he who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. There's great joy among the people of God because these oppressors, the Babylonians, had been defeated and the king was brought down. Verse 9 continues, Hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. The king of Babylon is going to die and the grave is going to receive him. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. They shall all speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we are? Talking about these kings that had become weak. Now you're no different than us, Mr. King of Babylon. Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, to the grave, and the sound of your stringed instruments, to the grave. The maggot is spread under you and worms over you. Now think about that. This is the king of Babylon, and he's not even going to be given a decent burial, but he's going to be buried all right. 
but maggots are going to eat his body. Worms are going to cover his body. That's not Satan. Satan is not a physical, he doesn't have a physical body, he's a spirit being. As you continue on past that text, past verse 12, those who see you, this is Isaiah 12, 16, those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth to tremble? Yeah, the king of Babylon did make the earth tremble, but no more. Why? Because he's brought down. He is defeated. He's overthrown. Continue the reading. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness, and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of the prisoners, all the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory, everyone in his own house, but you are cast out of your grave, not even given a decent burial, like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit. Oh, there's so much more that could be said. But someone says, wait a minute. Isaiah 14, 12 calls him Lucifer. And we know that Lucifer is a name of the devil. Well, I would say this, that Lucifer has become a name of the devil. But Lucifer is not found in the Hebrew text. Lucifer is actually a Roman name that is given to the morning star to Venus. And if, you're, if you have a center reference Bible, New King James, where it says Lucifer, look at your center reference, it says day star. If you have the New American Standard Bible, it says star of the morning. And the reason I use this picture, yeah, you've got the moon up here, but here's your morning star. When you get up just at, at, at dawn in the morning, you can see Venus, the morning star. The idea of the bright and shining star, the first that you see or the, the last that you see before the sun becomes too bright. What it's saying is that the king of Babylon was just like this morning star. He was beautiful. He was arrayed in glory. But because he did not respect the position that God had given him, God now was going to bring him down. And that's exactly what God did. God brought down the king of Babylon. So the Babylonian king would die. Now, it was Jerome in the 4th century who postulated the idea that this text in Isaiah 14 is talking about the devil. Did you notice as you read through this text in Isaiah chapter 14, read chapter 13 and 14, did you notice the devil is never mentioned once and never says Satan? The only word there that, that even gives a hint in that direction is the word Lucifer. But it was Jerome in the 4th century in his translation called the Latin Vulgate who gave this name Lucifer here. It should have just said day star or morning star. And he insisted that this was the devil. And since that time, this has become the standard answer that almost all religious people give. But the context will just not support it. It just won't. But someone says, Max, everybody knows. Listen, you've wasted your time tonight because everybody knows that the Bible teaches that Satan is a fallen angel. He rebelled against God, and that's his origin. That's where he came from. He was cast down to the earth and became the devil. Yeah, everybody knows that, except careful Bible students. They don't know that. It's just like, it's just like that other thing that everybody knows. You know, everybody knows that the Bible teaches that to be saved... You just say this prayer, repeat this prayer, and Jesus will come into your heart. You say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. Everybody knows that's in the Bible too. Except careful Bible students. They know that's not in the Bible. All I'm saying is this. Listen, if you believe that Satan is a fallen angel, rebelled against God, that's as good a theory as any, but don't try to use the Scripture to prove that because there is no Scripture. I'll just say this one more time. There is no Scripture, no passages that speak of the origin of Satan. I told you in the beginning you might be disappointed with this lesson, and maybe you are. But we search the scriptures, and the verses that people offer for the origin of Satan do not teach what they say it teaches. Context, your good friend. Don't pull these verses out of context. That's what the whole religious world does. That's what Satan did in Matthew chapter 4 when he's tempting Jesus. He pulls verses out of context. Don't do that. 
And when you study these verses that are offered in their context, they don't speak of the origin of Satan. And coming back to the point we just made, there's no passage in the Bible that ever says, just pray this prayer, invite Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved. Now people believe that's in the Bible because they've heard it a thousand times. They believe it's in the Word of God. What Jesus said is this, Mark 16, 16, He who believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. That's Jesus. Who will you believe? What you've heard a thousand times repeated by religious people or what Jesus himself said. You've got to make up your own mind. If tonight you're ready to make up your mind to serve Jesus Christ, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing. Come now.